I'll leave it with you, Mariana, to share the recording. And excellent. Yeah. Thanks so much. Started. Perfect. Um, and then, yep. Yeah. So my name is Martina Caterina. For those who don't know, know me, I'm the chair of the TAS team on law and policy of the Global Protection Cluster with the UNHCR in, in, in Geneva. Um, as you know, the, over the past couple of years, the, the task team has uh, started this project on uh, legal aid in humanitarian settings, and uh, this the webinar today um, is part of this broader um, initiatives. But uh, for today, actually, our, our main facilitator will be um, Paola Barsanti, the fantastic consultant that has been working with us for the past year, helping us with this work. So I uh, will just leave it... Uh, the floor to you, Paola, and uh, looking forward to hear from our participants and speakers. Thanks. Um, thank you so much, Martina, uh, and thank you to all of you who are already participating to the webinar. Uh, we have uh, many who are still joining. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for making the time to participate and thank you for the great speakers that have uh, on top of their responsibility also taken the time to uh, prepare their presentation today. Um, um, we are uh, just in terms of logistics, uh, Martina, if it's possible to, to mute uh, 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 the microphone so that the speakers can concentrate and focus on, on the inter intervention. If you have any uh, questions to the speakers, we will have a final section on uh, question and answer, but you can also uh, write your question into the chat. Uh, Martina will make sure to um, organize the, the conversation in the chat as well. So um, we are too many to do a round the table uh, and introduce ourselves, but I just wanted to let you know that this event really brings together uh, experts and the practitioners on legal aid and access to justice uh, from uh, many countries around the world, in particular countries in a crisis and humanitarian uh, context, uh, from a variety of organizations and from a variety of sectors. Uh, we have representatives from uh, UN agencies, uh, colleagues from uh, UNDP, uh, UNHCR, UNODC, IOM, just to mention uh, some. Um, we have colleagues from international INGO who focus on uh, protection, human rights, access to justice and legal aid. Uh, such as DRC, NRC, IRC. We also have uh, um, professors uh, and uh, uh, academia rec representatives, and thanks for Belfast colleagues for joining today, as this workshop is a uh, follow-up to the last uh, uh, meeting of the task team on law and policy uh, on reparations uh, that you facilitated. And we have also a, a broad range of representatives from uh, donors um, and uh, last but not least we have representative from national civil society who will actually uh, share their views and their knowledge on the ground uh, uh, during the presentation. As mentioned last week uh, during the celebration of 10 years uh, from the adoption of the UN principles and guidelines on legal aid in criminal matters, we really hope that this uh, uh, webinar contributes to create synergies among uh, um, practitioners on access to justice and legal aid that are focusing their work on development, humanitarian, peace and human rights sphere. Um, as mentioned by Martina at the beginning, uh, this webinar is framed within a broader uh, project led by the Global Protection Cluster Task Team on Law and Policy, uh, Legal Aid in Crisis Settings. Uh, great uh, if uh, you can share the link uh, to the project deliverables uh, that we aim at achieving uh, in 2022. 
um, if you're more interested in receiving uh, um, more detailed information on the projects and in particular the toolkit and knowledge that was developed uh, by the legal aid task force within the legal aid, uh, the legal um, task team on uh, law and policy, we will be happy to uh, share with you uh, further information. Um, the project uh, focused in particular on uh, developing a set of tools to enhance collective and collaborative analysis of legal aid needs and uh, legal aid and access to justice landscape. Now, this event today will focus on the role of legal aid in reparation context, and in particular uh, is uh, uh, one the first one in a series of webinars aimed at collecting good practices on legal aid in crisis settings. Uh, we will look at legal aid in reparation context through three thematic lenses, which you can see on the slide. Uh, so the speakers today will focus their intervention on good practices and lessons learned of legal aid policies and program by looking at three aspects. The first one, um, ways in, and initiative to enhance synergies between development, humanitarian, human rights and peace actors in the design and implementation of access to justice and legal aid intervention. The, the second one, we look at partnership with legal aid national actors, meaning civil society organization, but also private sector and duty bearers at national and the local level. And the third aspect will focus on the design and implementation of intervention aimed, aimed at addressing the needs of hard to reach population. Um, Let's look at the agenda for today. Uh, Mariana, if you can pass to the next slide. Um, so, uh, last year we conducted a survey on legal aid in crisis settings with more than 100 participants from more than 35 countries in crisis settings. And uh, we chose those aspects to look at based on the field perspective. Uh, also, the selection of the case studies today were actually chosen following the field uh, call uh, from last year, which was Colombia and Ukraine, uh, because they represent in different ways a laboratory where legal aid programs are designed and implemented in reparation context. As you can see from the agenda, we will have representatives from uh, UNDP, UNHCR, the protection cluster and INGO and national civil society organization on the two countries. And after the presentation, we will have a section on uh, question and answers. So without further delay, I will uh, give the floor to Maria Fernanda Jaramillo Pinto on NRC and their experiences on legal aid and restitution of collective rent rights of indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities. Thank you, Maria. Hello to everyone. My name is Maria Fernanda. I am the Information Consulting and Legal Assistant in one of the areas here in Colombia, um, specifically uh, in the Pacific Coast, where we have uh, a specific uh, collective communities, especially indigenous and Afro-Colombians. So today I'm going to talk about the restitution of collected land. Um, I, at the beginning, I am going to talk about the background, uh, about what we are doing in ICLA here and the focus of restitution of collective land. And at the end, I am going to share some good practice and lesson learned. Next, please. <clears throat> so Colombia has suffered the effects of the internal armed conflict. We have around over 9 million of people 
that they have been uh, included as a victims uh, in the uh, register of victims and more than 7 million of people they have been affected uh, by displacement. Uh, also in Colombia we have a very long history of laws, public policy and jurisprudence that have been focused in the attention and the reparation of victims. And actually we have a, a specific uh, public institution that is responsible for the reparation and the attention of the victims that the name is the victim unit. But also most of the public institutions of the state, they have at least one responsible, one obligation to respond to at least um, the first uh, stage of the emergencies when the people is displaced. Uh, so there is a lot of obligation in different kind of institutions, not just, not just in the victim unit. We also, in the context of Colombia, we have the recognition of collective territories and the self-government of ethnic communities. Uh, that means that the Afro-Colombians and the indigenous communities, they have the right to have collective land, but also to have their own or self-government. Uh, but we have uh, these communities, most of them are located in hard to reach areas and they have low capacity uh, to um, compliance uh, to the state. Uh, we also have some institutions that they are responsible to access to land, uh, specifically the National Land Agency, but also we have a specific institution that they are responsible for their restitution because there is a, a high level of people and communities that they lost the land because of the displacement and this institution is the responsible of the administrative uh, process to the people uh, uh, be possible that they go back uh, to their land and continue their life there. Uh, we also, um, there is the continuity of the armed conflict, so it's very difficult to talk to reparation with the conflict uh, is, um, is actually a reality that is not over. Um, and also we have a long and complex legal reparation process, so we are talking about maybe five years in, the, in some cases, but in, in other cases we are talking around 20 years. Uh, next please. Um, so here in Colombia, uh, the team that is working with the legal system is the information consulting and legal assistant team. Um, NRC in Colombia uh, has been working uh, for more than 34, 32 years and we provide different kind of uh, services. We provide uh, legal assistant, protection, wash, uh, livelihoods, um, and um, there is one that I am losing, and education services. Um, we provide in the legal services information consulting and legal assistance, and we cover different thematics. For example, we are working in housing, land and property, access to essential services, but we also facilitate the access to the register as a victim, especially in those uh, massive um, emergencies um, that they are related to displacement. Um, we also have a very long and a strong relationship uh, with the communities because they are located in hard to reach areas and in most of the time they don't have access to a, a different services but they also don't have a contact with public institutions or to other NGO. So we have, the, um, we have that a strong relationship with those communities. And we also have been working not just in the legal services, we, are, we have been also working in some advocacy actions that help us to show what is going on in those cases and specifically what's going on in the lives of the people and in the communities that we are working in. Uh, we have been focused in, especially in communities um, that they are vulnerable, especially, especially with indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities that they have been affected, especially uh, the violence in Colombia, uh, but also uh, the ICLA services we work with refugees, Venezuelans and host communities. Uh, next, please. 
Uh, so related to the support that we are uh, giving to reparation of indigenous and Afro-Colombians communities, we had at least uh, one context that helped us to do it, and is that we have the chance to work with these communities related to returns and relocation of ethnic communities, also to work in some legal actions related to access to land, uh, to land restitution, and in some cases, uh, we have communities that they have their own title of land, but they have overlapping. Uh, so we have been using a basic methodology that um, at the beginning we start with the, especially with the community relationship. Um, there we do the trainings, we do the characterization to see what's going on, what are the principal uh, problems that the community have. And later, um, with this characterization, we decide which kind of legal uh, service or legal, legal strategy we can do with them. But also, we, made, uh, we make people feel part of that strategy. So at the end, what we want is that the leaders, they feel that at, at the end, this legal action is uh, part of them. So we become like their lawyers. Uh, so we create together the, the best legal strategy um, and most of the our um, cases have been focusing housing, land and property. Um, later we have some complementary actions in different sectors. So when, he, when we are available to provide education, shelter, wash, livelihoods projects, so we try to complement this kind of action. And when they are, they are related to legal assistance, what we do is most the focus on essential services like education and uh, health assistance. Um, we, have been, uh, we have been having different kind of approach um, and we have uh, something that is very important in Colombia and that is uh, we have a kind of constitutional action um that you can ask for it when you have a violation of human and fundamental rights so that's the kind of action that we have been using in those cases and when you have you receive a negative a follow-up there is the possibility to ask for a revision of to the one of the highest court that is the constitutional court uh, we have two cases, one of an uh, indigenous community and another of a uh, Colombian community, that we, it was possible that those cases um, um, received the review of the constitutional court. So it's a, a good approach. Um, also, the partnership with a clinic, a legal clinics from the universities and the strategic litigation organization that help us to present amicus curai, uh, advocacy strategies uh, to show and to manage the state response, and um, also to strategic litigations developed with targets communities. Next, please. So we consider that one of the good practice in those cases and in our experience is that they are a focus in right-based, community-based and differential approach because we are working with this kind of communities. Uh, also uh, that we have been very uh, close to them, we have been working um, to make a stronger the structure of the ethnical communities and also the collaboration with other NGO, um, other institutions that they, they want to work in um, strategic litigation. Um, and also the use of different kinds of advocacy strategies. One of them is the use of video, visual documentary uh, and life histories about the communities uh, where we are working, but actually how their life is without the access to land or without the access to the reparation. Uh, some lessons learned and challenges. We have to keep improving the coordination with development, human rights and peace actors. There is, a, uh, there is a lot of things that we could do in those cases. Uh, so definitely we should improve it. Um, also, the community intervention plans can be based in multi-stakeholders cooperations. 
And also we should be ensured uh, that some plans uh, from the community were included in the public policy or in some development process that they are part of the of the state. Um, one of our biggest challenges um, is that this kind of process, they are long term support. Um, so we are talking maybe in, in process around three or five years. Um, and we need the process, we need the flexibility of donors that they actually they want to invest in this kind of process that they are long term funding. And at the end, uh, we consider that we have to incentivize a strategic and high impact lit litigations in the humanitarian context. And in our, in our experience, it has been very useful related to housing, land and property. But definitely, the, probably there is another kind of specific thematics where we should work in the reparation context. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And uh, without further delay, uh, the floor is yours, Jairo, uh, from UNDP. Thanks. Oh, good morning or afternoon. Um, first of all, I'm sorry for the background noise. I hope you can you can hear me well. Um, and uh, I will try to be very brief on this. Uh, I'm part of UNDP Colombia, and I will focus on effective participation of victims in Colombia's special jurisdiction for peace. Um, and following on the previous presentation, I will show how different transitional justice uh, processes are um, are simultaneous in Colombia. And I will focus on this example just to illustrate some of the work that we do in, in Colombia. So uh, first of all, and very shortly, um, our peace, justice and reconciliation work is completely connected to the other uh, areas of work of UNDP, poverty reduction, democratic governance, and sustainable development. We understand peace and justice as ends themselves, but also as means or enablers for development in the country. Then within this portfolio, we work in different topics in conflict-sensitive area-based development, in access to justice and human rights, access to ordinary justice and human rights, reintegration and reconciliation, and crisis response and early recovery also in victims and transitional justice, and this is where I will focus my, my presentation. Uh, then within these area of work, we have different um, programs uh, regarding collective reparation to victims, improved service delivery by transitional justice institutions, historical memory, and then I will also focus here on the support to victims organizations and civil society organizations in accessing transitional justice. So I won't, uh, I won't go into details here, but just to let you know that uh, as, as, uh, as Maria Alejandro was previously mentioning, uh, there, are, there is a wide array of institutional arrangements and uh, just legislation in Colombia and, and jurisprudence in Colombia regarding uh, victims and reparation and transitional justice. Um, so what we were um, listening before was mostly related to the Victims and Land Restitution Act in 2011. And then afterwards, uh, th there have been previous institutional arrangements in transitional justice in Colombia that have also created institutional architecture. And afterwards, um, after the final peace agreement between the government and the FARC in 2016, uh, there was the creation of the comprehensive system of truth, justice, reparation, and non recurrence uh, that actually created a few additional institutions, such as the Truth Commission, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, and the Special Unit for Search of Missing Persons. Um, and this is where um, I will focus now. So regarding the Special Jurisdiction for Peace, some, some quick context, it was created to investigate, clarify, judge, and punish the most serious crimes that occurred in Colombia during more than 50 years of the armed conflict. Um, it was created in, well, in, after the peace agreement in 2016, it was created effectively in 2017. It will last 
uh, for uh, 15 years, it's, uh, it can be extended to 20. At the moment, there are more than, there are over 13,000 uh, people that have voluntarily appeared uh, and, and uh, appeared before the special jurisdiction for peace, and now they are defendants in the process, most of them from previous FARC uh, uh, EP group some uh, a small percentage 24 by public force and the remainings uh, by state agents and social protest related um, accused people. Uh, it is it, it is conducted through different macro cases that analyze macro victimization. So this is also another innovation. It is not uh, an individual analysis of criminal of, of crimes, but the, the macro criminalization and the different political economy drivers that are behind these victimization. Some key aspects of, of the special jurisdiction for peace. It is a national court with full jurisdictional functions. Coordinated, uh, it coordinates work with the Truth Commission and the Search Unit for Missing Persons, and uh, it actually applies or privileges the restorative sanctions for reparation to victims and reconciliation in different areas. Uh, there are over 300,000 individual victims recognized, 309 collective victims, indigenous and Afro-Colombians, and there have been over 300 reports received by different uh, uh, groups uh, to promote investigation in the special jurisdiction. Then, uh, and this is the, the, the central part uh, of it, what has been our approach to these, um, and I will just mention a few things that we have work specifically to foster the participation of victims. Besides, we have also worked from the institutional side, strengthening the special jurisdiction for peace and other constitutional justice institutions. But in this case, um, we have privileged these few areas of work. First, the strengthening of an articulation with civil society organization for judicial representation of victims. So this departs from the base that the state recognizes civil society organizations record on legal aid and human rights litigation. And instead of replacing that track record for over 20 or 30 years, the Special Jurisdiction for Peace has designed a program that we co-implement uh, to ensure that we liaise, we create a network with 17 organizations to ensure that judicial representation, legal assistance, and psychosocial support is provided to the victims. Uh, so we, through this process, there are over 4,000 uh, 4, individual victims represented and over 300 collective victims represented that associates over 300,000 uh, individuals. Um, then another area of work is the individual and collective protection of victims, defendants, and other participating parties. The under, um, I mean, the base of this is that there are still personal and community security aspects of risks for participating in transitional justice mechanisms, as we are amidst uh, 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 um, a persistent conflict. And we try to ensure that we coordinate, we, we work together with the special jurisdiction for police, with local governments for articulation of protection measures. Um, and we facilitate the risk analysis studies, and then uh, we facilitate implementation of protection measures. Many of those connect protection with livelihoods and other development aspects, especially collective protection of groups. And finally, psychosocial support and logistic assistance for victims' participation in public hearings and events of recognition of responsibilities. And the base for this is that face-to-face -face engagement in the judicial process is essential for victims' effective participation in these processes if they are not able to, to go to public hearings, if they, if they are not able to attend uh, events of re uh, recognition of responsibility, they will be left outside the process. And then the support to civil society organizations for advocacy on critical issues. And I have here an example of sexual violence where we have uh, partnered up with five civil society organizations, feminist organizations and women-led organizations to uh, uh, advocate for the opening of a sexual violence case. This is together also with other UN agencies in the country where we have partnered up to ensure that this aspect that, uh, that has been critical in Colombia's conflict doesn't um, uh, is, is not left behind. So uh, this is uh, basically what I wanted to share. There are other, many other aspects of access to justice where we work 
also together with UNHCR and other agencies in the country. But I hope this has been a little bit illustrative of the kind of approach we take uh, to ensure legal assistance and effective participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jairo. Very, very clear. And thank you, uh, Maria. I think that shows the complementarities between different approaches, this different organization. Um, I kindly now give the floor to Adriana um, from UNHCR Colombia. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. It's really nice to meet you again. And thank you, Martina, also for this invitation to participate in this uh, webinar. Um, my name is Adriana Buccelli. I'm a protection officer. I work uh, in the UNHCR office here in, in Colombia. Uh, UNHCR in Colombia has been since working here since 25 years ago, working towards the protection of IDPs, but also more recently, uh, towards uh, the protection of persons that came from Venezuela, refugees and migrants from, from Venezuela since seven years ago. Um, my presentation is going to be very brief, uh, considering that my previous colleagues has cho have shown some of the main aspects of the, of the context and the work that uh, we are doing here in, in Colombia. We have to say that we work together with uh, NRC as co-leaders of the protection cluster and also with UNDP uh, since several years ago working towards solutions, but also more recently as co-leaders of the recently created uh, steering group on solutions considering the uh, protracted situation of IDPs in, in Colombia. Thank you. Uh, as my colleagues were saying before, um, the situation of IDPs in Colombia is um, very complex. It's a situation of a protracted displacement, but also a continuous uh, displacement and confinement situations. According to the Victims Unit Registry, we have now 8.3 IDPs registered in the official system uh, and more than say, 6 0.8 million of IDPs still needs humanitarian assistance or access to reparations. So that means that we need to focus on, uh, of course, in a solutions agenda. And that's why with, uh, together with UNDP, we are trying to um, reinforce our efforts in, towards this uh, solutions agenda. I have said that we have a protracted situation, but uh, we want to highlight the continuous situation of, of displacement, uh, considering the, the continuity of the armed conflict in the country. In 2022, um, 164,000 newly displaced uh, persons were affected by, by armed conflict. Um, with a disproportionate uh, impact on Afro and indigenous uh, communities. And despite the efforts to continue um, peace uh, negotiations and the decision of this government to promote a scenario of uh, negotiations with all uh, parts of the, of the conflict, uh, we uh, are concerned about the new risk uh, scenario and the conditions of security that uh, would affect uh, the, the IDP population in the country. As um, my colleague from NRC was saying, um, we have a very strong legal and public policy framework that is according with the guiding principle. But the main challenge, of course, is the implementation of that uh, public policies to promote the overcoming of the vulnerability generated with forced displacement. The victims law has a full recognition of IDPs as victims with rights to tr true justice and reparation rights. But we have a very important budgetary restrictions uh, to guarantee individual and a collective reparations. Um, and of course, uh, uh, one of the main constraints that we have is that the security conditions in several parts of the country are not guaranteed uh, until the moment. Uh, we have a very important opportunity as a country uh, with the peace accord signed by one, with one of the, our main guerrillas in 2016 
and uh, that uh, allow us to create the uh, or allow us to the country create the transitional justice mechanisms, including the uh, special jurisdictions of uh, of peace and the truth commissions. We have to say that um, the IDPs are the 80 percent or more of the victims in the country. So together with the NGOs, the UN agencies, we have to promote a better access of IDPs to those mechanisms. Next, please. Um, and regarding our work here in Colombia, uh, I have to. We want to highlight our effort to to promote access to justice uh, through. Uh, I have to say three kind of strategies. The first one is to promote a massive access to justice through a network of three legal clinics uh, of the universities that annually attend to more than 18,000 persons um, attended by this by this network. Some of the main rate, uh, rights uh, lit litigated include access to humanitarian assistance, registry, health and education, but of course also the possibility to for IDPs to access to the process, the complex, the complex process of reparation for one side and the uh, process of land uh, restitution. The second kind of strategy is uh, the support of NGOs or other legal partners, such as the Fundación Pro Bono, Pro Bono Foundation, to promote access to justice to people located in hard to reach areas, most of them rural areas, including access to compensation, for example, to elder, elderly IDP population uh, that in this moment is prioritized by the government to access to reparation, but mm, they face a lot of um, uh, situations to that, that in, uh, in, uh, have a lot of problems in access to, to, to reparation. And the third strategy uh, and regarding our role here in Colombia, uh, we provide technical assistance to the Constitutional Court. As Jairo was saying, in 2004, we have a very important a landmark decision um, by the Constitutional Court, uh, which declared the unconstitutional state of affairs regarding internal displacement. Since that moment until now, the Constitutional Court is following the situation of internal displacement, and uh, we have promoted it, IDP's participation in specific hearings uh, before the Constitutional Court. And it's uh, thanks to this uh, very important role of the court, this follow-up uh, mechanisms that has been created since almost 20 years ago, that um, the court has uh, ordered to several institutions how to act to promote better access in general to rights, but also to clarify um, the specific rights to truth, uh, justice and reparations for IDPs. At the beginning, since um, 20 years ago, for example, uh, IDPs were uh, not recognized as victims with rights to, to reparations. So for that reason, we believe that there is very important this, this particular role of the Constitutional Court. Next, please. Um, and in particular regarding the access to um, transitional justice mechanisms, uh, we have been working with the Truth Commission that uh, its mandate finalized uh, last year, um, specifically to focus on the investigation of displacement in border areas and the impact of displacement regarding or the connection with uh, exile. Uh, and the transborder movements of IDPs between between uh, countries. Uh, we promoted IDPs participation in, this, in, in this investigation and also uh, the presentation of reports, specific reports of IDPs uh, to the Truth Commission. And at the end, the uh, Truth Commission elaborated their final report last year, including a special chapter of uh, the impact of exile um, for um, um, for the Colombian population. In the next step, our main challenge is to try to promote uh, the implementation of this Truth Commission recommendation. Um, and the second uh, aspect that we have been working with this transitional justice mechanisms is with the specific jurisdiction of peace. Uh, we have been working together with HEP, by its acronym in Spanish, um, towards the investigation of the internal displacement as a crime. Mainstreaming 
the uh, in the internal displacement and in at least three macro cases that is um, being um, investigated by by HEP. Um, until the moment, the HEP decision is not to prioritize IDPs uh, or internal displacement investigation as one macro case, but uh, we have been working together in order to uh, mainstream this investigation in, in these um, three macro cases, uh, in particular uh, regarding the uh, crimes committed by FAC, the main guerrilla uh, that I mentioned before, the public forces responsibility, and also mainstreaming the uh, internal displacement crime in the cases of ethnic uh, population, in particular in one of the main departments affected by armed conflict, that is um, Choco Department. Also, we have been working with IDP's organization to present reports be, uh, before the HEP uh, and support uh, this organization to participate in the public hearings that HEP is uh, having across the country to receive these uh, kind of uh, uh, reports. So uh, these are our um, our uh, strategies that we are working here. I was thinking at the beginning of the presentation uh, and regarding the, the main objective of this webinar and the project that my colleagues are, are doing, what we would have done differently thinking 20 years ago and i have to say that uh, perhaps a good idea would be have more information regarding the internal displacement considered as a crime not only as a humanitarian um, situation but also trying to promote a more uh, specific information to regarding the causes of displacement the main perpetrators of displacement in order to provide uh, quality information to assure that this kind of transitional justice mechanisms have enough information regarding um, internal uh, displacement. And the second thing, and we, we have been working on this, is try to identify the main causes of displacement. And as my colleagues was saying, were saying before, uh, land issues are very, uh, is one of the axes uh, um, of the armed conflict here in Colombia. So uh, as UNHCR, we have been working since several years ago related uh, regarding the access to land, but also uh, to protect uh, legal protection of land, the legal uh, the restitution uh, of land, and also uh, and more recently uh, regarding the the um, formalization, legalization of informal settlements, considering that IDPs are located uh, mostly in urban areas. So that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adriani, and thank you, colleagues from, from Colombia. Um, I, I was uh, I was thinking about the seven minutes the time, but I know that uh, when uh, when there is so much to learn, uh, is is difficult to to, to squeeze in. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the reflections around around what could we as an international community uh, could have done differently. I think the access and production and analysis of data is definitely uh, one of the recommendations also stemming from the dis recent discussion around access to justice. Uh, and we hope that the legal aid analysis framework could actually also help looking at the origins of displacement and uh, as you mentioned Adriana the, the cost of displacement with uh, a focus uh, on land I think we have also colleagues here from from the Syria response uh, and other crises where land uh, uh, is uh, 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 in both a, a origin at the, to the conflict and the consequences on displaced and conflict uh, uh, affected population so uh, thank you for those reflections colleagues from Colombia and um, let me uh, give uh, the floor to Yaroslava, I hope I pronounced uh, your name correctly, um, from uh, Right to Protection um, uh, from Ukraine. Thank you so much, Yaroslava. Over uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paola. Um, uh, I am Yaroslava. I'm a strategic litigation lawyer of the Right to Protection, and I 
would like to talk briefly about reparations in Ukraine, uh, legislative aspect and our experience legal aid in this context. Uh, first of all, I would like to note uh, that nowadays, after the full scale aggression of Russia in February 2022, uh, unfortunately, there are no effective domestic remedies in Ukraine in the context of reparations in HLP cases, uh, housing, land, and property. At the same time, uh, there are legal means used by Ukrainian lawyers since 2014. Uh, when Russia invaded the eastern part of Ukraine. Uh, the first one is court mechanism. Uh, it is loading claims with Ukrainian courts against Ukraine and against Russia. Uh, the second one is administrative mechanism. It is legal aid in obtaining compensation under administrative procedure established by, Ukrainian, by the Ukrainian government. Uh, next, please. Mm, court mechanism. Uh, uh, in HLP cases against Ukraine, uh, the Supreme Court uh, took the following position. It awarded uh, the plaintiffs with compensation for the state's failure to fulfill its positive obligation under the European Convention on Human Rights, Article uh, 1, Protocol Number 1 to the Convention. Uh, it is right to uh, a peaceful uh, possession uh, property. In particular, the Supreme Court in its decisions noted that the positive obligations of the state, according to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, may include certain measures necessary to protect the right to property. Uh, namely, uh, the state must provide uh, in its legal system guarantees for the realization of the right to property and legal remedies by which the victim of interference uh, with this right can protect it. In particular, particular uh, by claiming damages for any loss and take all appropriate measures to protect property within its jurisdiction. And uh, as a result, the Supreme Court admitted the absence in the legislation of Ukraine of relevant provisions on compensations. Uh, uh, at the same time, there are uh, some shortcomings uh, of that, that court mechanism in Ukraine, because uh, the sum of compensation, which are uh, usually from uh, 600 euros to 3,000, Years are granted by national courts for the absence of legal remedies at the domestic level, and uh, they usually um, are not equivalent to pecuniary losses uh, uh, of victims, which usually estimated much higher. Uh, also, uh, in uh, 2022, the Supreme Court gave uh, green light for domestic courts to consider cases against Russia uh, uh, on the recovered compensation for damage for destroyed housing uh, caused by Russian uh, uh, aggression. It concerns HLP cases, but it's not limited to them. Uh, the Supreme Court reached uh, the following uh, uh, conclusion uh, given to the fact that Russia is an aggressor state uh, which grossly violates the principles of international law, and uh, that is why it cannot uh, claim immunity from prosecution in Ukraine. Accordingly, there is no need to receive the consent of Russia to consider the case against it in the Ukrainian court. Um, as, of to as of today, uh, there are a number of positive decisions of domestic courts against Russia. Uh, however, there is very uh, uh, sufficient shortcoming because uh, currently there is no mechanism to, uh, for their enforcement. Um, uh, the next one, please. Um, uh, so now I want to focus on uh, our uh, administrative mechanism. Um, uh, it uh, was created by the resolution of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. No, and provides the administrative procedure uh, of obtaining compensation for uh, damage or ruined housing. Uh, there are also um, a range of shortcomings uh, 
of Z mechanism uh, in particular, it provides payments maximum about uh, uh, 9,000 euros for ruined housing and uh, approximately uh, 1,000 euros for damaged housing. Usually, these sums are not equivalent to pecuniary losses of victims, which usually are estimated much higher. Uh, the above compensation is not enough uh, to renovate housing in proper manner or rebuild it or to buy new housing of satisfactory quality, uh, you know, taking into account uh, costs on real estate uh, property in Ukraine and building materials. Uh, but, uh, for example, uh, some of our beneficiaries uh, of our organizations, they are satisfied with uh, uh, that sums uh, of uh, compensation. Uh, the next shortcoming is that uh, compensation is provided to those victims who remained at the previous place of uh, residence uh, or uh, within the relevant settlement. Uh, so, uh, the internally displaced person are excluded from compensating. It is sufficient disadvantage. Uh, also, compensation is provided to those victims whose own housing is located in the territories controlled by Ukraine. However, a number of victims resided on the occupied territories. And uh, the last uh, shortcoming is that the procedure envisages waiver from ownership on the behalf of the state. State. However, uh, nowadays, uh, draft law on compensation of damage and destruction of certain categories of real estate as a result of hostilities, uh, terrorist acts, uh, sabotage caused by the military aggression of the, of the Russian Federation is considered by the Ukrainian parliament. Uh, the draft law uh, was initiated just after the full-scale aggression of Russia, and there are uh, really high expectations, high hopes on the adoption of that law, uh, which will set uh, the legal framework of the reparation mechanism in Ukraine. And uh, finally, I uh, would like, please, uh, uh -huh. uh, yes, thank you. Um, I would like to focus on the role of uh, our organization, the right to protection, which I'm representing now in providing of legal aid in the reparation context. Uh, right to protection is one of the leaders of the human rights movement in Ukraine in the, in the field of protection of the rights of internally displaced persons, refugees and state persons, stateless persons. Uh, it provides uh, psychological, humanitarian uh, cash assistance, and sure, we provide legal aid in different ways, legal consultations, uh, both uh, hotline and live, uh, legal support before the state authorities, uh, representation in the, in the courts. Uh, in our work, uh, we has uh, right to protection has an established internal and external uh, referral system, uh, which permits to work effectively. And uh, we succeeded in many uh, HLP cases uh, as of today. Uh, in particular, we, uh, we have 60 beneficiaries who were assisted in obtaining compensation through the administrative mechanism. Uh, about 20 cases against Ukraine, in which our lawyers won on positive obligations. Um, now we do not conduct cases against Russia, uh, as there are issues on enforcement uh, of decisions uh, against it. Um, and uh, also now our advocacy department uh, is currently working to finalize and implement compensation mechanism under the draft law, which I uh, mentioned above. Uh, that's uh, all I wanted to say very briefly. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, thank you, Yaroslava. Uh, thank you so much from this uh, perspective on the compensation mechanism. Um, uh, please, uh, Alexander, the floor is yours from uh, uh, Helsinki Human Rights Union. Thank you.
Uh, first of all, I welcome uh, all of uh, participants of this webinar and uh, I will continue uh, the uh, uh, theme uh, developed by uh, uh, previous speakers and uh, uh, my task is to present now the uh, uh, free legal aid uh, system and uh, possibility to uh, provide the legal aid and legal assistance to uh, vulnerable groups uh, to victims uh, that suffered from the uh, uh, consequences of the war started in 2014 in Ukraine by a Russian aggression. And um, uh, we have well established free legal aid system that started to uh, be operating since uh, 2012 and the first uh, uh, primary legal aid uh, assistance was provided since 20. 13 uh, exactly on the eve of the uh, invasion uh, of Russia to Ukraine. And uh, just one example of the effectiveness uh, of uh, the free legal aid system, uh, uh, the statistics demonstrate that uh, the secondary legal aid in Ukraine provided by the uh, lawyers, uh, uh, mainly uh, advocates of this free legal aid system since uh, the beginning of the work in uh, uh, 2013, from the 1st January till the end of the last 2022, was about 837,000 uh, particular individual cases supported by the advocates uh, in the secondary, I, I just repeat, it's not the consultations, it's secondary legal aid in the criminal proceedings uh, and other uh, criminal matters. Uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, really um, the effective structure that uh, continue to uh, uh, follow the challenges uh, arised by the uh, facts and the consequences of the war and to, with providing the uh, consultations and uh, possible legal assistance to the uh, victims uh, of this uh, war and uh, uh, with the changes uh, introduced into the legislation they have a right to uh, have among the clients uh, the IDPs and the uh, victims of the war and uh, uh, thus uh, we have much brighter uh, possibility with the um, uh, legal assistance uh, in all uh, not only criminal but also civic matters and uh, supporting the, to the uh, victims of the war. Ukrainian Helsinki Human Rights Union uh, or in uh, uh, its life has uh, the uh, 20 uh, public reception offices with the lawyers that provided the free legal aid uh, 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 in very different, almost in all regions of Ukraine, uh, especially with the uh, uh, focus on the vulnerable groups and mainly with the IDPs and, uh, well, uh, it's the complex activity that uh, um, provided not only the legal assistance, but also we received the information and the facts of the uh, possible um, war crimes or uh, other uh, challenges and facts of the um, uh, uh, um, uh, crimes that uh, are occurred uh, due to this war and uh, uh, we try to introduce these uh, data uh, not only in the uh, register but uh, uh, also in the um, possible uh, uh, legislative work and uh, mentioned uh, by uh, Anastasia, the uh, draft law was also uh, with some uh, um, work uh, uh, of uh, the lawyers of our organization. We provided some uh, proposals to the uh, draft uh, legislation on the um, possible compensation for the destroyed property and uh, uh, we also 
uh, well, just one example uh, on the uh, effectiveness of the uh, these 20 public reception offices in last 2022 is uh, uh, about uh, 15,000 consultations uh, and uh, uh, such amount allows us to have some statistical uh, uh, analysis and uh, the, to present the most uh, um, significant uh, 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 groups or, and uh, groups of population and uh, the uh, possible cases that are uh, uh, of most importance. And uh, just one uh, uh, number is presented here that IDPs uh, uh, are uh, about 53% uh, um, among the uh, clients of this uh, public reception offices. And the main topics that uh, were discussed and uh, uh, the uh, clients addressed with uh, where the uh, reimbursement and the compensations uh, um, in uh, the all possible uh, uh, manners. And here I may just uh, refer to the uh, uh, huge uh, uh, initiative that uh, uh, invited the person to uh, bring the uh, uh, cases to the European Court of Human Rights. It was an uh, initiative uh, launched by the Ministry of Justice and uh, Ministry of Digitalization, including uh, our organization, the Ukraine Helsinki Human Rights Union. And uh, uh, well, uh, just one example in the first day of opening of such possibility to introduce through the uh, digital uh, means the data, uh, well, uh, the number of the person who addressed to the services was more than 130,000. So it was enormous number of the uh, um, uh, person who tried to get to the European Court of Human Rights uh, with the uh, claim for the uh, uh, or just information about the uh, damages that uh, they uh, were the victims. And um, we uh, are working with the strategic litigation cases and I ask to uh, the next slide. We work also with the uh, uh, Paula, please. Uh, we, uh, we work also with the difficulties that arise from the uh, uh, consequences of the war. Uh, and the main uh, problems are on non-controlled and occupied territories that were occupied uh, since 2014 and uh, with the um, invasion since 21st of February of last year, 2022. We have newly occupied uh, territory in four regions, uh, and now uh, these territories are not only gray zone of law, but I uh, may uh, determine it as a black zone of law because no law is here. And um, I here I may refer just on one uh, memory that uh, was since 2014 when the uh, some territories were occupied by uh, pro Russian proxies and then deoccupied by Ukrainian forces. And uh, I've asked uh, of one of the uh, uh, governor of uh, Lugansk region, how many times uh, they uh, used to uh, reintegrate all legal procedures and reestablish Ukrainian uh, legislation and uh, Ukrainian order, let's say. Uh, well, and it takes several months for uh, the territories that were under occupation for several weeks. So several weeks of occupation and uh, six uh, uh, eight uh, months is for restoration of legal rules and the normal life. And here we have the uh, eight, almost eight year of occupation and uh, uh, more than uh, eight year of occupation and uh, uh, the uh, lack of uh, legislation and uh, the um, 
uh, lack uh, of uh, recognized uh, institutions and bodies uh, on uh, these territories and um, uh, plus uh, we have also the uh, all the problems that are uh, referred to the transitional justice uh, uh, and the uh, issue of uh, the collaboration. Uh, and here I may mention that even the uh, the members of the legal process like judges, prosecutors and advocates, they are in very different position because when we are speaking about the lawyers uh, as advocates, uh, then we have to rely on their possibility to protect or somebody to save uh, in this uh, huge uh, or in this very difficult conditions that are on non-controlled territories. And uh, last attempt uh, in Ukraine with the proposals to consider the uh, advocates and the collaborators uh, were uh, also one of the challenge that was uh, uh, arised before the legal society, Ukrainian legal society, and uh, well, um, successfully uh, we overcome these uh, uh, legislative attempts. But it's just one example uh, how the uh, steps uh, to the transitional justice uh, systems should be. Uh, mm, presented and prepared and uh, include uh, all the possible uh, steps uh, that uh, uh, are constructed on uh, Ukrainian side and uh, will take into account the role, the uh, responsibility and the uh, involvement in the processes on non-controlled territories. And um, well, one of bright uh, of the bright example is the penitentiary issue. And, uh, and uh, uh, I may say that uh, since uh, uh, the beginning of the war, uh, 2014, uh, Ukraine lost about 16,000 persons on non-controlled territories. And uh, 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 it's a very strange situation when the Russia and the uh, mm, foreign state uh, take uh, Ukrainian uh, prisoners and uh, uh, transfer them uh, to other uh, colonies on Russian territory and uh, mm, instead of return to Ukrainian territory. And um, uh, the good question uh, is about the uh, newly uh, mm, uh, verdicted prisoners who are on non-controlled territories and so what Ukraine will do with this uh, penitentiary population without uh, uh, considering them as the criminals from uh, the, uh, their state point of view. And um, we uh, here uh, have more problems than uh, decisions, but still we have some proposals and recommendations. And I ask to uh, 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 come to the next slide, to the last one uh, uh, for the solution. And here we have uh, uh, probably the most sophisticated and the best way in uh, for, uh, in our view, uh, the strategic litigation, our organization probably the biggest in Ukraine that has the uh, uh, most significant number of the cases in the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, uh, now we have more than 250 pending cases uh, related to this war only to this war and uh, for very different uh, items mentioned uh, uh, the article uh, one uh, of the protocol one right to property mostly we have uh, the article three uh, it's uh, uh, right uh, not to be uh, the victim of the torture and human treatment and uh, 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 the uh, right to life uh, uh, reflected in the Article 2. Uh, well, and uh, we expect that uh, the strategic litigation will uh, um, duly um, help with the 
uh, elaboration or not only the decision on the uh, level of the European Court of Human Rights, but also with the uh, mechanism on uh, national level with the um, facing the problems and overcoming of the problems. And um, uh, here we have just uh, several uh, I finishing. Thank you. Thank you so much because of the other speakers. Thanks. So I'm finishing. Ah, OK, sorry. <laughs> After your sign, well, thank you. Uh, th thank you so much, uh, uh, Alexander. That was uh, really enriching, and uh, the uh, reflections around the effect of uh, long years of occupation are definitely uh, worrisome. Um, let me give the floor to uh, UNDP, to Ivan, and sorry again for having to cut the presentation, but we are just uh, aware of the time. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, so speaking on behalf of UNDP uh, Ukraine, um, here as you will see in a slide like usually usual um, UN's uh, uh, battery of terminology references to um, Agenda for Sustainable Development and uh, Sustainable Development Goals. This here just to highlight uh, that uh, uh, free legal aid uh, as a part of access to justice and access to justice as a part of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of the whole a whole uh, 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 a range of goals uh, moving towards uh, you know inclusive society with uh, you know peaceful just and inclusive society uh, are uh, key referential strategic points for for UNDP. Uh, so every activity that has to do with uh, um, access to justice and free legal aid is basically based on 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 these on these uh, uh, strategic reference uh, points, and there these are applied uh, throughout uh, UNDP uh, country offices uh, all over the globe, um, working uh, either to address uh, human rights issues, human rights violations, but also people impacted by the conflict, as well as to build to build a good governance in, in peacetime. So uh, free legal aid is often set either as a direct goal or is it just or is is a part of tools for achieving other goals, as, as mentioned here on this slide. So I won't dwell on that, just to, to say that uh, also in Ukraine, uh, development of free legal aid system, legal aid access to justice has been a goal in itself, a separate goal for, for UNDP, uh, but it's also a part of many different programs and projects and some and sub sub projects which are which are uh, having some some other uh, particular goal and this uh, this is all now coming into play together uh, and is being joined uh, in in response uh, to the conflict to the war in in ukraine so next slide please yeah so uh as for just to, to go briefly to through a situation in, in ukraine i mean the, ukraine has uh, very developed free legal aid uh, system of, of a hybrid tarp so that with, with dedicated state, of, state authorities and contracted lawyer but with you know with a lot of cooperation with civil society organizations as also mentioned here uh, uh one of the broadest uh, ranges of potential beneficiaries compared to other countries especially when it comes to to uh civil civil matters uh, uh but then uh it has uh been facing uh, a, a tremendous, tremendous challenges. Uh, we are now referring to 24 February of 2002, and uh, the, the expression we're using for you know for, for this benchmark date is full scale invasion, and this is because there was a invasion preceding this February invasion. So there was a armed conflict, uh, but territorially limited and also limited in scale, taking place in Donetsk and Luhansk, and, and also belligerent occupation of, of Crimea, which is you know, st still still ongoing, uh, which uh, already posed uh, significant challenges and changed the way how the legal aid system is, is operating. 
it added uh, some categories which had not existed before, such as uh, inter 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 um, internally displaced persons, IDPs, uh, and war veterans. In the meantime, then also, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, and additionally, victims of conflict-related uh, uh, sexual violence, crimes, torture, and, uh, and ill treatment were added as as categories with the most recent changes of the free legal aid law uh, in uh, in 2000 2020 22 uh, but this uh, uh, conflict since 2014 uh, already provided for some opportunities for the for the free legal aid system for a country for govern uh, government for a civil society organization as well as for international actors including UNDP uh, to try to address some of the challenges and problems which uh, prepared unintentionally the country also to become uh, and the free legal, legal aid system to become even more resilient now up to the full scale invasion. So with uh, as of February 2024, uh, there are many key you know, challenges. First of all, uh, you know, extreme systemic uh, stress that the country is under attack. So there, there are, especially now with missile uh, waves of missile attacks, uh, um, the, the life uh, is in jeopardy everywhere. So there is an ongoing destruction of a, a large scale loss of life, torture, loss of property, livelihoods, loss of documentation and, and so on. And the growing number of IDPs, refugees, other victims of the conflict and so on, uh, and also competing needs. So whether to what are the priorities, defense and security, uh, but we even when speaking of, about addressing uh, you know con concrete concrete cases or, or concrete uh, concrete issues raised by 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 individuals uh, or provision provisional rights there is also a challenge of um, the whole system operating uh, in the context of a legal context of martial law but there are also uh, I want to, to emphasize some uh, compar uh, comparative advantages and when I say comparative I mean advantages of Ukraine compared to other situation of either con uh, post conflict situations or uh, not not uh, so much places elsewhere in the world ongoing conflict uh, first of all, there is a functional and resilient uh, free legal aid system and very functional uh, government, you know, with with all the mass scale uh, uh, um, destruction and atrocities. This is still this is very functional country. Experience accrued since 2014, as I mentioned. Then also very importantly, political commitment by the government and all the key political political stakeholders, as well as strong social contracts. So the the population, the civil society, everyone is now uh, playing as 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 one, especially when it comes to protection protection of of rights. So this is not something that has been present in, basically in in the largest number of of countries facing challenges uh, either after con conflicts or during the conflict. There is also EU accession uh, path for, for Ukraine, which means uh, embracement of, of uh, uh, EU standards, uh, not necessarily only in, in relation to free legal aid, but in, you know, in general, and also uh, inter importantly, uh, international support which has been quickly deployed and which is which is uh, ongoing. And one of the conclusions of the, of the survey that was done recently was that uh, with you know despite all the ch challenges uh the uh, population at large but especially those the most affected and most vulnerable including idps have ranked their satisfaction with the free legal aid system uh rather highly as as you can see uh so uh, please next slide just to go briefly uh, to what UNDP uh, was doing and has been doing uh, in support of free legal aid system in, in Ukraine uh we have like two Tier, but two tiered approach, but um, uh, very in intertangled approach. One on one side working with national authorities, on the other with uh, with civil society organization. So, from amongst national authorities, free legal aid coordination center is a is a key partner, and there's been a, a, a number of. Um, activities and projects and support provided to them here some of them are listed I, I will not spend a, a lot of time on them just to highlight uh, that uh, it was a support to uh development of online solution for uh, for improving uh, access to justice so the UNDP's role in in uh, this in providing this support was to provide um, IT expertise, IT support, but also legal expertise and legal knowledge how to craft these IT solutions. So in order to fit uh, the, the needs and the legal legal process. Uh, 
Uh, then uh, the help desk, uh, as I mentioned uh, here, tracking of uh, distribution, legal aid request, uh, online learning courses, and so on, all the way to providing technical support, which is now ongoing, to free legal aid centers to address the the the, the basic challenges posed by the by the uh, armed conflict and invasion. So this is provision of material equipment, especially for free legal aid local centers that have been relocated. Uh, and there is a, uh, also something that we believe uh, would uh, help um, uh, functioning of the whole uh, justice system, and this is further integration of mediation into a free legal aid system. So there was a mediation law passed in 2021 as far as I know, but uh, there are still mediation and alternative dispute resolution mechanisms to be developed, and development of mediation and integration of the mediation in this system may uh, uh, unburden uh, courts and, and institutions, even administrative institutions, uh, and, and help uh, solve uh, many problems uh, out, uh, outside the court process, which would also strengthen the uh, social uh, social fabric. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, the, the other uh, uh, stream of, of, of partnership and activities is with local civil society actors, which mainly uh, boil down uh, through uh, our uh, program uh, um, uh, dealing or addressing uh, challenges uh, in in the east, so in the Donbas area in Luhansk and uh, and and, and um, Donetsk partly since 2017, from reaching out to remote settlements and and people living close to contact uh, lines through civil society organizations, training paralegals among local Roma community. Advocacy in hiring of lawyers in local pilot community in Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast uh, to support to, uh, small and newly created civil society organizations. Some of these uh, activities uh, are finished uh, as planned. Some had to be discontinued uh, because of the of the war. Uh, at the moment, there is uh, there are also two important. These are just examples, and uh, the two additional examples of, of ongoing support that I want, wanted to highlight is provision of uh, uh, free legal aid services to IDPs in four transit and five coast communities, and the capacity development of 20 local civil society organizations as as legal legal aid uh, providers in transit and, and host communities, and this support uh, from UNDP and the need for support will will be growing as the as the number of uh, the victims of the conflict as the the level of of destruction unfortunately and the number of those vulnerable uh, is going to grow until until uh, the end of the war um the uh, i would i would just ask you for for next uh, slide and before mo moving to to uh, uh concluding with uh something that it's still to be uh, explored and still still to be done uh, i would just like to to highlight a, a couple of le lessons learned from previous activities uh, and 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 support and in the situation of an ongoing armed conflict, I mean, drawing lessons learned is is quite tricky because there are you know moving targets and 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 uh, the the developments on a, on a daily basis which create uh, new needs which have not been even uh, um, uh, anticipated uh, before they they happen. Uh, it what proven very instrumental in helping people and maintaining the system is is the development of um, IT tools. Uh, generally, digitalization is is one of the one of the uh, key strategic uh, strategic developments uh, the, in 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 the last uh, decade or, or or so that that helped also you know government in Ukraine became so so resilient. Uh, the other one could be also uh, um, a decentralization as well as the very developed uh, uh, civil civil sector. So partnering up with with civil sector used to uh, help in strengthening social social fabrics in in different communities. Now we can also in, in communities and in, in the east of Ukraine. Now we can also transpose these experiences and importance uh, emphasize the importance of strengthening social fabrics also. Uh, in in communities where there are there are a lot of uh, internally displaced persons who are finding finding their their new new homes there or new new jobs and, and trying to uh, to settle there at least for the for the time uh, for the time being, it is very important to constantly maintain communication with the 
most the immediate beneficiaries of the of UNDP's interventions. In this case, these were um, free legal aid centers as well as, as the the final final uh, users. Uh, so that you know to to adjust. Uh, uh, all the all the um, uh, tools that were developed uh, to create new ones or to, to transpose them to maybe to serve new new purposes. So moving uh, away from from what has been uh, what UNDP has been doing so far, uh, and now I'm uh, moving into the area of what would be usually traditionally you know, considered tr uh, transitional justice uh, mechanisms. But uh, I left it for the end because this is something that is still to be done and to be worked on. Criminal accountability for war crimes. There is a huge uh, now um, uh, development support provided by the international community and a great commitment by by uh, judiciary, national judiciary uh, in in Ukraine. This is something that would uh, require uh, a, a, a lot of intervention, also in terms of of free free legal aid. From uh, and, and there are already already such mechanisms uh, uh, appearing or working, such as victims victims uh, hotlines. There would be a need for uh, training uh, defense attorneys to to provide uh, defense in, in line with fair trial rights for the for the defendants in these cases, which which has been also initiated by the Center for Free Legal uh, Aid itself, which is very commendable. Uh, then victim support. Uh, this is something that uh, I believe uh, would um, use the experiences of working with victims of war crimes to provide for a comprehensive victim support system for all criminal cases that would be in line with the um, 2012 uh, EU directive uh, for uh, on, on support to victims of violent uh, violent crimes. And this is something that UNDP is also strategically moving moving uh, towards. And at the end, reparations. I said at the end because uh, a lot of what has been done uh, also through free legal aid so far have uh, uh, have had and is having a reparative effect, reparatory effect. But there is still no comprehensive and dedicated reparation system yet. It's still under it's still under construction. Uh, there is a uh, the. The government, in partnership with the civil society organization and with UN agencies, with IOM being in the lead, is working uh, uh, on 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 the on designing a, a long-term, comprehensive uh, uh, and whole of a government and whole of a society approach to to reparations. And once these these comprehensive long-term reparations are in place, as well as possible interim reparations, especially for the most vulnerable group, most likely this is going to be for the victims of uh, and survivors of conflict-related sexual violence crimes, there would be important role for free legal aid as a sort of a gateway uh, for the reparations. Uh, as a, a first and initial contact point that would uh, then uh, refer to uh, victim survivors, uh, users, uh, uh, those that are entitled to reparations, uh, to further uh, referral pathways that are going to be to be created. And this is something uh, uh, that is uh, still being being discussed, and we believe would be uh soon be designed because there is a strong uh, uh, commitment and and desire both on the part of the society and the government unlike in many other uh, post-conflict or conflict situations to to uh have reparations uh, mechanisms uh, in place soon thank you and uh, I'm, I'm here to answer also questions as well as my two colleagues Svetlana Kolishko and Ivan Honcher who are working on the ground and on on free legal aid uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Alexander. And thank you, Yaroslava, uh, for the great uh, uh, inputs on the different approaches. I would like to give you the floor to Claudia, the Senior uh, Protection Cluster Coordinator from Ukraine, uh, for closing remark on the case of Ukraine. I hope uh, some of you can stay a little bit longer uh, for the questions and answer section. I'm sorry they, uh, this presentation took long but I hope they were enriching uh, uh, as much as they were for me uh, the all the speakers uh, brought a lot of their work uh, to stage today and a lot of ref reflection uh, thank you over to you Claudia
Thank you very much, Paola. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to take too much time because what needed to be said has been said. And I think that just the link it up with the, the presentation the UNDP colleagues uh, just gave, one of the aspects, the, the forward looking perspective, right, from a cluster point of view, which is in, in itself dealing with the humanitarian coordination of a protection response. But I think it is forward looking, considering what are the, the things that the people communicate back to us, IDPs in premise. Just to give an example, we really had a protection monitoring tool uh, currently rolled out, uh, revised, trying to assess uh, access to remedies, and still we have a significant percentage of individuals being assessed, uh, primarily IDPs, who are unaware of specific mechanism for remedies and compensation for conflict-related injuries. So I think coupled with the HLP discussion that and the presentation that R2P colleagues uh, gave at the beginning really gives a bit of a perspective of what Ukrainian CSOs, humanitarians, development, key stakeholders and government actors will need to look into. Uh, just as a close up from the cluster point of view, what we try to do is that we try very much to leverage with the existing uh, legal aid uh, group, the HLP technical working group, just to name a few, advocacy working group, we try to leverage on partners' expertise in legal provision, in legal assistance, trying to uh, capitalize on what they do best, which is indeed legal support and legal counseling, and trying to find solutions to um, most some, I mean some, not all, but certainly some of the legal issues that arise in the context of HLP, compensation and access to remedies. Um, it is not um, easy, of course, also because we need to recognize different realities, different contextual challenges, but is the, the what, what we try to facilitate with the class and bring it together legal actors, HLP experts, other protection actors to work together on common files from different angles. And I think that is indeed the added value and how we are going to be able as the context uh, moves and shifts to find solutions which is not one fit for all, but it's very much looking at the different realities of uh, conflict affected people in Ukraine. Just as a close up, and thank you very much for, for uh, inviting Ukraine and for the colleagues from Colombia before. Over. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I think uh, your your closing remarks are very well noted and uh, um, they fit, I think, well to well, very well with the three ambitions of this uh, workshop, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, also touched upon the issue of awareness raising of uh, hard to reach population among which displaced on the opportunities to get remedies. Uh, so definitely, uh, I think the role of coordination of the protection cluster uh, is, is very well welcomed in Ukraine and, and in other, in other contexts. Um, thank you so much for all the speakers from the two case studies we, we heard today. I think they reflect upon uh, common challenges uh, but also uh, lessons learned around coordination uh, and uh, good practices around use of data, digitalization, uh, participatory and inclusive approaches uh, with victims and support uh, for victims to participate in a special transitional justice jurisdiction and to access justice. I think uh, uh, overall uh, the work of the task team on law and policy uh, with this project has been also to recognize that the really legal aid is at the center of humanitarian intervention and also at the center and also um, very much anchored in access to justice uh, intervention. Sorry, I think uh, someone is talking um, at the same time. So I think I'll open up. Uh, I know that uh, uh, the time is a bit over for question and answer, but given that some, uh, the majority of the speakers are still here, um, if there are any burning questions from uh, the audience, uh, we will really much appreciate you uh, taking the floor.
Um, well, yes, uh, Mark, uh, please over to you. Uh, thank you so much for the interesting uh, insights. I, you know, one question I wanted to ask everybody is, it may go beyond the, the the specific examples of this group because in many cases you're looking both, you know, Colombia and, and Ukraine are slightly different to that. You have a long standing conflict in one. There was a lot of time to develop legal frameworks and legislation to make sure to you could address this. Ukraine's trying to do that now. Absent sort of the the existence of a major conflict, what are the what are the motivating factors that would get states to actually put in place the types of measures necessary? Uh, did you find in your experiences that there were certain certain legislative mechanisms that could be put in place uh, that would allow for access to legal aid and facilitate access to legal aid? Part of the reason I'm asking is we did a joint paper with UNHCR on using the rule of law as a tool for um, addressing statelessness. And of course, there are similar challenges in that you need to have legal mechanisms in place, regulatory frameworks in place, and a responsiveness. So I know it, just checking your experience, what were those, What are some of the triggers you found that were the most effective ways to get states to think about putting in place uh, this, those frameworks? Thank you. Paolo, would you like to take Stephanie's question as well? Yeah. So maybe then we can. Yes, thanks. Uh, please, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Hi, Martina. Hi, everybody. Um, well, I just wanted to recognize the work of uh, the United, United Nations agencies and the other speakers. Uh, many times I just wanted to remark that these agencies generate more trust in the community than uh, the same state or official entities um, that also provide legal aid. So it, I wanted to just remark that. Um, my name is Estefania Vargas. I'm, I'm a professor at Harvard and University, and I just wanted to ask you some, some things. I know that there have been many constraints for the restitutions of indigenous uh, people, uh, people's land in Colombia. One of them is that very often legal aid uh, is provided in Spanish, not in their indigenous languages. And also most of the official documents on transitional justice and reparation uh, mechanisms is also written in Spanish. So um, uh, since uh, UN agencies and other international organizations have been working in providing a legal aid, uh, I would like to know uh, how have you been addressing this uh, in terms of providing legal aid on the languages of ethnic groups in, in Colombia, if this has been addressed or if have you identified the same challenge. And another question that I have is uh, that we are in front of, I mean, we have seen through your presentations that uh, we are facing like the expansion of uh, legal uh, aid services. And I just wanted to know if, um, I mean, legal aid services from universities, from in, uh, UN agencies, from other international organizations. And I just wanted to know if, have you considered the implications of the expansion of these legal aid services and counseling services, if this has been considered the impacts on um, the judicialization of reparation policies or peace policies or transitional justice. I mean, um, if sometimes the judicialization of uh, policies has advantages, advantages or disadvantages. So um, I would like to to know that, please. Okay, so maybe I can answer the first question of Stephanie. Um, actually, NRCs have been working uh, for a long time with indigenous communities, especially with two ethnics, that is uh, Waunan and Embera. And it happened when we tried to do, uh, to provide trainings on information, consulting services to the community. We also need the help of the leaders. And most of the time they are our translators 
Uh, but also we have seen that, for example, it's more difficult for the, wom the women of the, of the communities that they can express what they think. Um, in some moments, they actually they consider that uh, they don't speak Spanish, but you realize that actually they can understand you. So in this moment, uh, we are working especially um, in the services that we provide in the emergencies, in the massive uh, emergencies of those communities. And in this moment, we are translating some documents uh, related to the access uh, to the um, victim register. And also we are working in some videos and audios in Embera and in Waunan and about three specific subjects. The first one is uh, who is NRC? And um, so the people of the community, they can understand in their own language what we have been doing there. Um, the second subject of the video and the audio uh, is related to um, the access to the right in, in the reparation and the assistance to the victims, uh, especially the related to displacement. Um, the three video and audio, the third one, um, is related to the mechanism that we have to the people, uh, they can express uh, if they are agree to our services or maybe uh, if there is something wrong that we have done and they want to let us know. So um, I think that maybe at the middle of this year we are going to have this audio, uh, these videos and also the documents in their own language. So um, we are going to be very happy to share with all of you these materials. Um, I think that there is too much to do with indigenous and um, especially with some indigenous communities and especially those that are located in hard to reach areas. Um, but I think that at least is, um, is one step. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. And uh, uh, I'm not sure there are some of the participants, uh, Ivan uh, uh, or Claudia, that want to address the question from Mark. Uh, it would be interesting to hear your views. Thanks. Yeah, maybe maybe I can try to address a question. If I understood the question well, it was about uh, uh, the, the, the motivations or mechanisms that, that triggered the development of a free legal aid um, system. Uh, and uh, well, I mean, d definitely the, the, the conflict and and the transitional justice needs and exigencies is, is has not been something that moved development of free legal aid system in Ukraine forward because this is something that the free legal aid system is now learning to cope with and will be coping with. So the 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 triggering motivations were you know preceded the the, the all these development. And as someone who worked uh, uh, on, you know, in in other countries in a similar uh, institutional cultural context in Europe, like in Western Balkans or elsewhere, I can I can uh, I would assume that this is a combination of uh, different factors that were uh, in in play, you know, at play uh, in various countries of Eastern Europe. Uh, this is always a combination of a genuine uh, determination and a need uh, but on you know and, and realization by some men, people in the in the in the government also in the civil society and you know academic circles but probably to enable you know people to enjoy their rights as much as possible to empower them through you know being able to make informed decisions to you know, to contest discrimination to uh enhance people's trust in the justice system to provide for you know enable in that way greater state legitimacy and then ultimately stronger governance and and so on and so forth and then the second the the second stream of motivations was always coming you know a, a, like with a desire to be a part of the group we speak about co context of european states uh whether it would be uh to accept all the standards um created under uh, the system of the Council of Europe and uh, 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 those developed by the jurisprudence of the European Co Court of Human Rights or those uh, created nationally uh, by uh, states that were or were becoming um, uh, EU member states. 
and this may apply even to countries that uh, were not always uh, on a steady European path. But at the time um, when uh, Ukraine adopted the free legal aid uh, law in 2011, it uh, preceded the revolution of dignity. So it was moving towards the EU, but there was no uh, at that time still such a clear uh, uh, EU EU membership uh, perspective. Uh, uh, forward, but it took time for you know to, to turn in, in Ukraine from 2009 uh, uh, from 1996 when the constitution was adopted and it was a provision uh, basically calling for allowing for free legal aid to a free legal aid law to be to be uh, ma materialized. So it's always a long process and then a long process to to develop the fully functional free legal aid system. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, Mark, I think I gave some food for thought on, on your question. Uh, I think there are two questions in the chat. Uh, one, I look at you, Claudia, even if it's uh, related to IOM, I'm not sure IOM is still present in the room, uh, but it's related to IOM led effort to elaborate comprehensive approach to reparations. And what are the avenues for Ukrainian human NGOs to participate to that process. I'm not sure whether um, this has been discussed uh, uh, within the protection cluster uh, group. Uh, if not, uh, I would uh, uh, then uh, uh, put in touch with the right colleagues of IOM. Uh, and then another question uh, for um, UNDP. Uh, what are the protection measures UNDP use to ensure that victims and defendants are participating in transitional justice uh, systems and, and policy won't further face protection uh, issues? So all the uh, measures about protection of victims uh, that participate to uh, legal uh, uh, and uh, uh, reparation proceedings. Um, uh, Jairo had to leave, so I'm not sure whether uh, some uh, speakers from Colombia can answer that questions. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, definitely put you in touch with the with the right uh, interlocutor. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I see that uh, on these two questions we will have to follow up with uh, with the speakers. Uh, so I'll take attentive note and uh, and and put you in touch. Uh, maybe uh, if there are no other questions, I would say uh, we end the webinar here with uh, a, a big thanks to the speakers who have worked hard on the presentation to share uh, good practices. And in terms of ne next step, I will uh, definitely follow up with those uh, who have participated, share the recordings, share the presentations, and as well trying to pull together uh, some lessons learned and good practices that emerge from the different par uh, participants and the different approaches. Uh, thanks again uh, to UNDP, UNHCR, R2P, uh, Helsinki uh, Human Rights Group and NRC uh, uh, for, for their hard work uh, and the uh, Thank you for all who have taken the time to um, listen and participate actively. So thanks. Thanks to you. Thank you.